Lulu White was one of the most famed criminals of New Orleans during Gilded Age America. Though from humble origins, she began to work as a prostitute and her beauty allowed her to acquire a clientele of wealthy men. She later became the Madame of Mahogany Hall, a luxurious mixed race brothel, but in the end, her million dollar empire came crashing down. Join me to find out how. Lulu Henley or Lulu White as she was also known, is believed to have been born around 1868 on a farm near Selma in the state of Alabama. However, some historians have cast considerable doubt on this, and in the absence of a birth record, argue that circumstantial evidence suggests that she was actually born years earlier, perhaps in the late 1850s, but most likely during the period of the American Civil War, between 1861 and 1865. She came from a mixed race background and was termed a quadroon at the time. This term, which is racially insensitive by today's standards, was widely used at the time to indicate someone whose ethnic background was believed to be one quarter black. She claimed to be a migrant from the West Indies and thus of Creole descent, but it is unclear if this was accurate or not. There is much about Lulu's life which was invented by her and at various times she claimed that her family hailed from Cuba, Jamaica, or one of the other many islands of the West Indies. Little is known about Lulu's early life, but it must have been one of considerable deprivation. This, after all, was the period of reconstruction following the Civil War, a conflict which had utterly devastated the economy of southern states like Alabama, and which took many years to recover from. It may have been the rural poverty which states like Alabama faced in the post-war period which led Lulu to migrate to New Orleans, the main city of the state of Louisiana to the west of Alabama in the early 1880s. Lulu was possibly barely a teenager at the time. In order to make ends meet, she quickly entered a life of crime. Again, the details of much of this are unclear, but she was arrested on several occasions for acts of petty theft and other misdemeanors. She was also soon working as a prostitute. By the mid to late 1880s, as she entered her adult years, she had amassed a considerable client base, attracting several wealthy clients. Through this work, she also quickly began amassing a considerable amount of money, and by the early 1890s, she had capital to expend. It was this which allowed her to enter into business in such a way which would bring her to the attention of many of New Orleans' citizens. Lulu was living in New Orleans during a very interesting time in its history. The city had emerged in the 18th century as the capital of the vast French colony of Louisiana, which laid claim to much of what we know today as the American Midwest. It became part of the United States following the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, when the United States government purchased the colony from France for $15 million. Thereafter, New Orleans retained much of its French character, with a strong Creole influence owing to extensive migration from the Caribbean to Louisiana. New Orleans expanded quickly in the 19th century, growing from 50,000 inhabitants in 1830 to 150,000 in the 1850s. It was captured by the Union early on in the American Civil War and escaped much of the devastation which other southern states suffered as a result. By the time Lulu arrived at the city in the early 1880s, the population had exceeded 200,000 people. While New Orleans did not become a major industrial city, Lulu's life was shaped by another development here in the 1890s. By the late 19th century, prostitution was prevalent in New Orleans, as indeed it was in nearly all American and European cities to a much greater extent than it is today. In an effort to regulate the trade and create designated zones in which prostitution could be practiced, the municipal authorities of New Orleans passed an ordinance in 1897, which stipulated that prostitution should be limited to a designated area of the city, the famed Faubourg Treme, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city. It was known at the time as the center of settlement for freed slaves prior to the war and Creole immigrants from the West Indies while today, it is famed for being the centre of much of the city's jazz scene. The new designated area became known as Storyville, 
so named after Sydney Story, the New Orleans politician who had pioneered the legislation to regulate prostitution in the city. He was later horrified to learn that his surname had become a byword for the red light district. It was here in Storyville where Lulu would carry out much of her activities over the next 20 years. Prostitution was regulated here, much like any other industry. Sex workers registered with the city by purchasing what was known as a blue book for 25 cents, through which they advertised their services and were able to operate legally. Lulu was arguably the individual in New Orleans who profited the most from the creation of Storyville as a neighborhood where prostitution could be practiced legally. Her activities in this regard are synonymous with Mahogany Hall. While there were many brothels and parlors in Storyville, Mahogany Hall was believed to be the most lavish of all of them. Located at 235 Basin Street, it was a mixed race brothel which employed somewhere in the region of 40 prostitutes at a given time. Mahogany Hall was built at Lulu's direction at an enormous cost of $40,000. It was a four-story brothel with 15 rooms with private baths and five parlors. The rooms were lined with mirrors and mahogany furnishings and surfaces, while marble flooring was used in the common areas, along with a winding staircase and even an elevator. Thus, Mahogany Hall was built to the highest standard and clearly identified itself as being for the wealthier clientele from the beginning. While Lulu had amassed a significant amount of money herself in the 1880s and 1890s, the amount of money involved in the brothel's construction, which would be well in excess of $1 million in today's money, was considerable, and it seems likely that she had the financial backing of business or political interests in the city as well to aid her. After opening its doors in the early 1900s, Mahogany Hall quickly began to generate enormous amounts of money. Lulu lived lavishly in tandem, purchasing the finest clothing and jewellery and acting as the host of the establishment. Such was the extent of her expenditure that she became known as the Diamond Queen of the Demimonde and would often appear as the host at Mahogany Hall wearing a red wig topped with a tiara and brandishing diamond rings on every finger. The services offered at Mahogany Hall were advertised through the blue book and a separate red book and brochures distributed at Lulu's behest. Thus, we find the listing for number 235 North Basin Street in the early 1910s, which lists Lulu's name at the top of every entry for the address and then lists Annie Stone, Emma Sears, Irene March, Corinne Valerie, and so forth. Lulu, who by this time did not work as a prostitute herself, but solely as Madame of Mahogany Hall, also turned the venue into one of the most noted jazz venues in New Orleans. During the 1900s and 1910s, early jazz pioneers such as Jelly Roll Morton and Joel King Oliver, the latter of whom would later mentor the great Louis Armstrong, played at Mahogany Hall. Armstrong himself was born in the neighborhood in 1901, and later immortalized Lulu's brothel in the title of the song, Mahogany Hall Stomp. Lulu's business ventures and activities eventually extended beyond Mahogany Hall and prostitution. For instance, in 1912, she used some of the profits from Mahogany Hall to open a saloon called Lulu White Saloon at 1200 Bienville Street on the corner of Basin Street and just a stone's throw away from Mahogany Hall. In 1906, she also headed out west for a time to California. Here she demonstrated her shrewd business sense by investing in the emerging industry of filmmaking which was in its first stages of development in a place called Hollywood on the outskirts of the city of Los Angeles. However, while she had spotted the potential of the industry, her efforts to acquire one of the largest film studios which was being developed here came to naught as she was undercut by a business partner who betrayed her while acting as her agent in California after she returned to Louisiana. The failure to acquire a stake in one of Hollywood's large studios in the mid-1900s was just the first of several setbacks which Lulu suffered business-wise in the 1900s and 1910s. Eventually, Storyville was shut down by the government during the First World War. Following America's entry into the war in 1917, the US Navy deployed most of its resources 
to port cities like New Orleans. The Secretary of War, Newton Baker, became concerned that prostitution there was distracting troops bound for Europe, and so in late 1917, he pressured the municipal government into rescinding the 1897 law concerning Storyville. Thus, prostitution effectively became an underground trade yet again in New Orleans in 1917. Mahogany Hall declined sharply thereafter as its business activities became illicit. The building went into a period of steady decline and was eventually sold in 1929 for $11,000, a fraction of the 40000 it had been built for, especially when inflation is taken into account. The plush interior had evidently diminished considerably over the years as the new owner, a local department store owner, used what had been New Orleans' most upmarket brothel as a storage room for his shop. This was not Lulu's only headache from a business perspective. In 1919, the United States Congress passed the Volstead Act, which paved the way for the prohibition of alcohol in America in 1920. Thus, Lulu's other major business, her saloon on Bienville Street, also had to change its business model in 1920. She turned it into an establishment selling soft drinks. Evidently, she did not accept these new realities easily. We have a mugshot of Lulu after she was arrested in 1920. Here we find a woman, who was probably in her late 50s or even her early 60s, suggesting that she was indeed born sometime prior to 1868, as speculated earlier. Yet, every setback can create an opportunity. Like a great many other former saloon owners and purveyors of alcohol, Lulu Henley became a bootlegger in the 1920s, producing alcohol primarily in the shape of spirits like rum and whiskey in illegal stills in New Orleans and the wider state of Louisiana. While her operation was clearly not as great as Al Capone in Chicago or Lucky Luciano and Mayor Lanxi in New York and New Jersey, Lulu became a significant figure in the Louisiana crime world created by the prohibition. She was monitored by the authorities and while they repeatedly arrested her on charges of bootlegging and quote, running a disorderly house, nothing ever stuck, and she managed to avoid any lengthy incarceration. Exactly what happened to Lulu Hendley in the end, like much of her earlier life is shrouded in mystery. Some historians in New Orleans believe that she died in 1931, at the residence of another former madame in the city, Willie Piazza. However, there is conflicting evidence on this, and a bank teller at the National Bank of New Orleans later testified that a Lulu White had made a large withdrawal from the financial establishment in 1941. If nothing else, this testifies to the manner in which Lulu Henley became one of the legendary figures of early 20th century New Orleans. Conversely, Mahogany Hall was eventually demolished in the 1940s, though the first floor of Lulu Saloon on Bienville Street is still standing today as much as it was when the Madame of Mahogany Hall first built her business empire here. Lulu's life has been portrayed in popular culture on several occasions. As the New Orleans historian Al Rose noted in his 1970 book on Storyville, the character of Mae West from the 1934 film Belle of the 90s was clearly inspired by Lulu, but owing to the pervasive racism of American society at the time, any racial references were removed from the film. Numerous subsequent films down to the 1970s had characters which were also based on her. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Lulu White, I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life and story down in the comments and if you have any other suggestions, also be sure to leave them in the comments. Check out the products I use in my description down below in the links in the description. And that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.